Yeah, I think we've already checked the mic. I'm pretty sure you guys can hear me. Um, what do we got? Oh, the participants, the participants are rising. Uh, Brian, I might answer your questions at the beginning of the class, so why don't you hold on for a second? And a couple of things I was going to talk about. I'll just leave the one I have in the um, private chat to you. Yep. All right. Um, okay. So somebody brought to my attention last week that when I posted in the syllabus part of the class, I screwed up here. So you guys can see the shared screen. I think you can see the shared screen. Yeah, we can. Yeah. I also know that the um, lectures don't seem to, the links to the lecture videos don't seem to be up yet. All of the at the same place. So if you click on any of the links for any of the videos, you'll find the other one. Um, so um, what I screwed up was when I posted the schedule here, I thought I'd posted the entire worksheet, the other tab being the grading. And so although we talked about this, I think on the second or third day of the class, um, when I posted it, it never got uh, put up there, or I posted it wrong. There's a checkbox I checked wrong. So I fixed that this morning when somebody brought it up. Um, but we've got quizzes, CAM exercises, other assignments, the lab practical exam, and the comprehensive final. Um, and I worked out this grading scheme mostly because some people are remote and some people are here on campus. And uh, it, I couldn't be sure that all the people that started on campus were going to finish on campus either at the beginning of the term when we worked all this out. Um, you see the comprehensive final exam is only worth 10% of the grade. Um, and so it has the potential of sort of moving you up one grade or down one grade, I guess, depending on how you do on it. Um, the CAM exercises, we're doing the last one this week. Um, the quizzes, now we missed the quiz this week, the intent was to have five quizzes. Where am I, this is Canvas, right? Okay, so I can go over here to assignments. I've also reorganized the assignments page based on the syllabus there. Um, and so we didn't actually have a week five quiz. Uh, by the time I got reminded to post it and could have posted it, it was the middle of the weekend and I didn't want to do that to you guys. So I actually didn't put up the week five quiz, but I did keep it to make the math simpler. So I put it in here and in the grade book, you'll see when you click on week five quiz that everybody got full credit for it. So you get those points so that the math works out when we do the uh, calculation. So we have one more quiz. It's the week six quiz. It'll be up on Wednesday. We can talk about it on Thursday. It'll be due next Monday. Would you be willing to post the questions and solutions to the week five quiz for studying purposes? Yeah, I could do that. Or something, something very similar, at least. Is the final exam a quiz on Canvas or is it something different? Yeah, it is identical to the format of the quizzes that we're doing it will have more questions but it's on canvas you'll have um we'll get that out by monday of next week and you'll have until friday to finish it um will there be unlimited tries like the quizzes or no in the past i have not done unlimited tries for the final exam um, I usually do two tries for the final exam instead of unlimited. The purpose for the second try isn't really so that you can go back and try to get a higher score. It's more in case while you're doing it, something happens and it doesn't get submitted correctly, you have a chance to redo it without having to ask me to reset it for you. Um, that's what I've always done in the past. We could, um, I could be swayed to have it be unlimited tries. 
I think if I look through the uh, the quizzes, most people don't try it that many times. Um, let's um, let's start a discussion forum thread on that topic, and by the end of this week, um, by Thursday, I'll decide. Um, but uh, if you have an opinion, either yes or no, on the unlimited tries, post it in the discussion forum why you think we should or shouldn't. And, uh, and then based on that, I'll make a decision. We'll talk about it on Thursday. Because I usually don't do that. Um, all right. And we've got one other assignment that's also due on the last day of the term. And it's about the topic of this week's and a little bit the beginning of next week's lecture. Um, and so we're going to be talking about this today. I'll go through the assignment today during the class to make sure everybody understands what I'm looking for. I have done this assignment several times before as a group project, but I'm going to do it as an individual assignment this time. Uh, again, for the same reasons we discussed about whether or not we would do group projects in the term. Um, let's see what else we have. The CAM assignments are all in. Um, the lab practical will be two parts. There would be a on canvas part of it and the in the machine shop part of it. The people that are remote will only do the on canvas part. And then the coverage of final. Two. Is there is there some sort of way to practice the lab practicum? Yes, this week's lab is about practicing the things you need to do for the lab practical. Okay. What is the on campus part of it? Do you mean like a paper exam or something? No, you stand in front of the machine and use the machine to make a part. The same thing you've done every lab exercise. Wait, if the on-campus part is the machining part, then what's the lab part? Not machining? Yeah. There will be on Canvas questions about how you do the machining and to see if you understand the materials that we've done. And then okay. in the lab, Next week, when you do one of your two lab sessions. Oh, Canvas. I thought you said campus, like on campus. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, that, that would make it. Yeah, on, cam on campus. We're all going to, one at a time, we're going to gather at the fountain and we're going to see who can jump the highest. The person that can jump the highest gets an A. Everybody else fails. <laughs> no, sorry about that. Yeah, that was a um, <laughs> Canvas and campus do sound the same. Yeah, that's my bad. All right, so yeah, the lab practical in the lab, you'll be at the machine, you'll go through and do the steps on the checklist, make a part. It's a simple part, it uses one tool. <coughs> um, okay, so yeah, so that was, that was my bad. When I posted the schedule, I thought that I posted the schedule and the grading stuff. Um, and some people had asked about that last week and that's when I figured out that I screwed that up and uh, didn't have it posted correctly on Canvas. Uh, but again, if you go to the syllabus tab, we've got what we're doing this week and this, you can scroll back through all the weeks. And there's the schedule and that scrolls over because it doesn't all fit on the page. And then the there's a blank on that lab schedule. There could be. Week six on lathe. There's a blank. Yeah, that's because when I made the schedule, I hadn't decided yet what you were going to do there. Okay. There was, there was a blank for that same spot. Uh, no, we did this. Yeah, that was because I hadn't decided what we were going to do when I made the schedule. Um, it turns out we did tool offsets and then work offset, or sorry, we did work offsets here. We did tool offsets here, and the two bases came together in the same week. So that was, that was about being flexible and not knowing how the labs were going to go because we'd never done this format before. All right. Uh, any other questions? And Brian, I'll, I'll take care of that. I see in the, the message. Any other questions? Anything else that was unclear? Um, the grading for the CAM should be back to you. I know that it's not there yet. Um, I have somebody helping me with that, and I'm going to find out where we are and why the grades aren't posted yet. Any other questions? 
Okay, outstanding. Then let's get to today's topic. I'm very, uh, I'm very proud of the title of this presentation. I don't know if I should be proud of the title of this presentation, but I am very proud of the title of this presentation. And um, it, it comes from one of my favorite moments as a um, MQP advisor. And this was, a, uh, this was a big project. I think there were about 13 students working on the project. They had divided themselves into subgroups and some people working on this part of the project and some people working on another part of the project. Um, and there were three advisors, so three co-advisors. And we had one meeting a week where the entire group got together with the three advisors and all of the students working on the project. And, uh, and we would meet in a big conference room and they have the computers and all that stuff. And I, I've actually, I think maybe in class, I've talked about this student before. He was the, the one who, um, he at the beginning, uh, his first experience working in the lab, he, um, he came in to work on a project and he just had to adjust a couple parameters, post the code, run the program, adjust the parameters, post the code, run the program. And after doing that for two weeks, he felt like he had learned so much. He said, uh, he said, now that I know how to do machining, engineering is so much harder. And, and that was after two weeks of actually just watching a machine work for a little while. So that was, um, so this student was in this MQP and somebody presented the SOLIDWORKS model of the design of one of the parts that was going to go in the, the thing they were making. And, uh, and he puts it up there and he's showing it all and it's got, and it's got the things we talked about last week, the things that the kids with CAD do. So it's got the curvy surfaces all over the place and it's all blended together and it sort of wraps up on itself. And to serve the function that they wanted to do, it probably was not a horrible design. But, uh, but the other student in the group, he stood up. He stood up and he looked at his project partner and he says, dude, how are you going to make that? And that was when I declared victory because I knew that that student at least understood about the design for manufacturability. And so, so that, that title stuck around for, for this lecture. And uh, sorry, I'm so proud of it, but uh, here we go. So I've got a question for you. And it, and it goes to the question, what's the cost of changing a light bulb? And if one light bulb costs 99 cents and another one costs 6.99, which one should I buy? And so let's see, I don't have a poll going, but we can use the uh, participants thing. So say yes, if you think I should buy the 99 cent light bulb and say no, if you think I should buy the $6.99 cent light bulb. And so go ahead and pick a choice, everybody choose. The total should add up to 32. So I get 13, I get two no's. So two people have voted for 6.99. 19, 20 people have voted for 99 cents. I've got, see that makes 26. So that means I've got six people that are asleep. Oh, no, not quite six people that are asleep anymore. Now it's only five people who are asleep. Let's see who they are. Okay, I won't call on anybody that's asleep. Um, so you come down to the bottom of the list. I never call on people at the bottom of the list. Matthew, Matthew, not Matthew Wong. You said yes. So you want to buy a 99 cent light bulb? Is it Garnieri? How do you, spell, how do you say your name? Guarneri. 
Lunaria. Matthew, you said 99 cent light bulb. You, sh you don't want to change your vote? Uh, well, I mean, I'd rather spend two dollars, and then it, that would equivalent to twenty thousand instead of twenty thousand hours instead of seven dollars. Okay, so if I can get the cost of light bulb B down to two dollars, you'd buy. Yep. Okay. Uh, I get five people that said no. Leo. Leo, you said buy the expensive light bulb. Why? Uh, the way I see it is. Yes, the light bulb is more expensive, but you spend less time actually, you spend less time replacing light bulbs, less time, you know, driving to get light bulbs, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. So when I came up with this question in, uh, in I, so I don't know if anybody, uh, I'll, I'll clear the responses here. The, say yes, if you live off campus. So a bunch of you live off campus, and if you live off campus, keep it saying yes if you live in a Worcester three-decker. So Worcester three what? A three-decker, or as we call them in Worcester, three-decker. And that's one of these uh, apartment buildings you see around Worcester that has three floors. Each floor is an apartment. We call those three-deckers. And so I used to own a bunch of those. I owned them all around in this area. And, and that was how I made my living was by renting apartments to people like you. And I, when I started that, I bought the 99 cent light bulbs. In fact, I bought a lot of the 99 cent light bulbs. I probably only paid like 50 cents for my light bulbs. And I would go to the, the discount store and the outlet store and I would buy the cheapest light bulbs that they made. And then I learned. So while I was doing that, it, I actually started, I started um, working on my master's degree while I did that. I finished my master's degree, started working on my PhD. I started a consulting business and, um, and I could sell my consulting time for about a thousand dollars a day. So I could sell my consulting time for about a thousand, between a thousand and two thousand dollars a day. So I could do that or I could go change a light bulb. And so what I, what I found out, oh, and, and you never have to change a light bulb when it's convenient for you. You have to change a light bulb when the tenant complains about it. And the tenant complains about it when you're having Sunday dinner with a group of friends at your house. And then you have to get up. You have to go to the place to see, oh, it's the light bulb way up there that I can't reach. You have to go back, you have to get a ladder. You go back to the place, you climb up there. Oh, I forgot to bring the light bulb. You have to get a light bulb. You get to go to Home Depot to get a light bulb. And I, I figured out at one point that it cost me almost $1,000 to change a light bulb with that iterative process. And so I would pay anything for a light bulb that would last twice as long. Now, that was my own internal accounting and, of course, the opportunity costs and all that stuff. But uh, what we're going to talk about today is similar to that idea. What I wanna talk about today is um, when we're cutting something in a CNC machine, what goes into the cost of making that cut? So when we're, when we're making that cut, we're forming chips, we're, we're taking away everything we don't want so we can get to the part that we do want, what goes into the cost of doing that? And so, um, and then we're gonna talk about, oh yeah, stand up if you would pay 69.99 for the light bulb. I forgot that one was there. All right, so, so this course is about manufacturing science and engineering, CNC, prototyping, all this stuff. What I wanna talk about though is the cost of doing these things. So I'll stop the screen share for just a second. And rotate to the whiteboard. So, what goes into the cost of cutting something in a CNC machine? I wasn't wandering away. I needed to find a marker that you guys could see on the whiteboard. So what are, what are the things that contribute to the cost in, in CNC machining? Labor cost. 
Oh, some people are typing. Um, what did you say? Somebody said something out loud. Uh, labor costs. So labor. Can somebody see the chat thing and read off what it says there to me? Electricity. Runtime. Tools. Stock and material costs. So you labor, power, time, tools, stock. Was everything else in the chat window? Was that a repeat or is there something new? Upfront machine costs. So it costs it cost money to own the machines. What else? Material stock tools, runtime, electricity, <laughs> the cost of changing light bulbs. Um, the cost of changing light bulbs thing was a separate thing, or unless someone else put it down. Um, yeah, that's all right. So, I mean, that, that does, so that, that's maintenance of the facility, though. So, labor, power, time, tools, stock, owning machines, maintaining the facility. You want to say leasing? Right, so we have leasing the facility. Somebody that said labor, what did you mean by labor? you have to pay someone to run the machine and also partly maintenance. The machine operator? Well, um, is there any other labor associated with the cost of making a part? Somebody said. Yeah, the uh, you, you pointed out a spree and other software. So the last pricing data I have for the spree um, seats that we have here at WPI was that each one cost $35,000. And there was a roughly $5,000 a year maintenance fee. We get it for free from a spree on a handshake deal with the CEO, though. So don't worry about it. It's not your tuition money. So upfront machine cost, the building, the material cost. All right, so we've got the labor for the machine operator. There's also the labor for mopping the floors. Right, answering the phones, doing the sales, paying the CEO. Paying for insurance, paying down debt that you have because you own the machines. I guess we covered that up here. Uh, returning capital to the investors that allowed you to create your company. So we have a lot of these kind of costs that are really overhead. So these are things that we're going to have to pay for whether or not we're making the part. But the things that directly impact our ability to make the part, and so this time here, it affects the machine operator. It also affects the cost of leasing the facility and probably goes into owning the machine. Um, so we've got labor, power, time really is, is a multiplier that goes on these things. So there's the cost of the power coming in based on the amount of power over time that we're using. 
we have the tools. How does time impact the tools? The more the tools are used, the more they'll be worn down. You'll have to replace them quicker. So the more time we use the tools, the more quickly we'll have to replace them. Does time impact the stock material? It might. It might impact the stock material a little bit if the cost fluctuates on, a, on like a global market, right? But in reality, time does not impact the cost of the stock material. So time doesn't have any impact on stock material. So that's interesting to note. Time definitely has an impact on how much power it takes to do it. The longer we run it, the more power we use. And time has a direct impact on labor for the machine tool operator. Time also has it. So let's imagine that we're making so many parts that we can't finish making the parts that we need without having to replace them, the tools. So if we're using the tool long enough so that the tool wears out, then we're gonna to have to also have the machine operator change the tools. And so there's the cost, not just of the tools that wore out, but there's the cost of changing the tools. And so we focus on how much cost goes into making the physical part. I think we've sort of captured the big things that are on this list. Now we started out with, with the idea of how much does it cost to change a light bulb, right? And, and so my point of changing the light bulb said that the cost of changing the light bulb far outweighed the value of the light bulb. Now, is it possible that that's true about uh, tooling and CNC machines? Is it possible that the cost of changing the tool outweighs the cost of the tool? How much does a uh, how much does a machinist get paid? Anybody know? Anybody want to guess how much a machinist gets paid? No guesses? $12 an hour, somebody guessed. That's below the minimum wage in Massachusetts, isn't it? It's pretty close to the minimum wage in Massachusetts. So we did a, we did a program here where we took um, displaced workers, so people that were collecting unemployment. We hired WPI students to teach them how to operate CNC machines. And so they, they basically, they got to learn how to do the things that you guys are doing in the lab. Um, they got about that level of experience working in the lab. And, uh, and those guys were starting between 18 and $22 an hour. So that's an operator. That's a person who knows enough to put the part in the machine, tighten the vice handle, press the start button. So operators get paid about $20 an hour um, so this ranges from 20, probably to, fifty. That's probably the range of pay rate for those people. The person that's doing the tool changing and the setup in the machine is getting closer to this end. The person that's just loading a part in and pressing the button is getting closer to this end. <clears throat> so how much does one of those end mills cost? Anybody?
Anybody know how much an end mill cost? Anybody could Google it and find out? There, I just typed in cost of half inch carbide end mill. Is the screen share? So I just typed in cost of half inch carbide end mill on Google. So Amazon Assistant says we can get one for $37. Not sure I'm going to buy that one. So this one is $354. Not sure we're going to buy that one either. Let's try MSC, an industrial supply company. No, I don't want to log in. End mills. Come on. There you go. What kind of end mill do you guys want? George says between 60 and hundred dollars. Let's see if George is right. Let's just get a regular old square end mill. And we wanted a half inch. No, not that one. There we go, half inch. And so 50, 40, 80, 30, 40, 30, 60, 85, 68, 70, 27, 53, 103, 61, 47, 86. So I think George is pretty good between 60 and $100. Um, you can get one cheaper. You can get one more expensive. And so how does it take to assemble a tool, put it in the machine tool? You take the old one out, bring it over to the tool assembly bench, break it down, put the new one in, bring it back to the machine, probe the new tool. How long does that take? Say roughly 10 minutes. I was going to say 15 because that makes it a quarter of an hour. And so, but yeah, 10, 15 minutes. So it's going to cost between five and twelve dollars. Call it fifteen dollars. What's the cost of not making parts for fifteen minutes? Anybody want to guess? Depends on what the parts worth, right? Depends on how, how much the customer wants to pay for the parts. So the cost of not making parts is a variable, but it certainly exists. There certainly is a cost for not making parts. Okay, so we know that labor is important for making the, the parts. I'm sharing the screen, I want to turn off screen share for a second. Okay. So we know the labor is important for both the tool change and the cutting. We know the power is important. So when do we change the tools? When do you think we should change tools? When you stop getting accurate parts. All right, so we want to change the tools when we can't get good parts anymore with the tool. That sounds fair. I mean, I always like to say, so why why do we stop getting accurate parts with our tools? You start getting wear and deflection on the part or on the bit. I think the deflection is going to be there whether the tool's new or not, except it could go up. You're right. It could go up because as the tool wears out, the cutting forces are going to go up. 
The cutting forces are going to go up because that that uh, effective rake angle is going to change. As we as we change that rake angle, it's going to make the um, shear angle longer or more shallow. As the shear angle gets more shallow, the shear force has to get longer. <clears throat> so you're right. The deflection could go up as the forces go up. And, uh, and what we really want to do, we, we definitely want to change the tools before they explode. So if the tool wears out too much, it might still be making parts that are serviceable. But when the tool explodes, bad things happen inside the machine tool. So we certainly want to change the tools before the tool explodes. So drawing something on the board here, it's a little quiz for you. As I draw this thing on the board, what does it, what does it resemble? Check and see if you're awake. What did I draw on the board? It's not stress and strain. Get more generic, a linear, a linear graph passing through the origin. Yeah, maybe I should move the origin. There. But it looks like a linear graph. You'll agree? Everybody likes that? What, what, what would I want to graph if we're talking about uh, tool changes and the cost of making parts? I should do the line in the wrong direction. That's the wrong slope. What would I want to graph? So profit rate would be nice to graph, but, but we want to get more focused than that. We want to focus on the cost of making the cut on the machine tool. Is it the cost in power? based on how dull the tool is? So, yeah, if the, the, the power consumption will go up if the tool wears out. And we actually can see that from the formula too, because we have the tool sharpness in the equation for estimating power. But what if we calculate the, uh, the tool life And so if I'm trying to decide which tool to buy, I want to know something about the tool life. And it turns out the cutting speed you go on this axis. And so it turns out that we replace the tools because they wear out. They wear out faster if you cut faster. So the rate at which they wear out goes up with the average cutting speed at which you're cutting. And in fact, if we look at the log of tool length versus the log of cutting speed, we get a linear equation. And we get that if there's a, um, there's a famous mathematician, science, early scientist, Arrhenius. And the Arrhenius equation says, that in chemical reactions where heat is involved, you often get this log, log behavior that gives you a straight line. You get a slope here, the rise over run, that can tell you, basically you can predict at this cutting speed, I'll have this tool life. And the tool manufacturers do these kind of calculations they don't typically share that data directly with the customers, but you as a customer can also gather this data. And so if the tools wear out, the faster we cut, should we cut faster or slower in the machine job?
What other information do you need before you can decide if you've got faster or slower? What else do you need to know in order to decide if you should cut faster or slower in machine shop? Well, how much it might cost to spend more time on it. Right, so we actually can... say with like power to the machine, is the, the longer the machine is on, the longer whatever bill you have for electricity. I don't think we really, so the power consumption probably also goes up with the speed of cutting. Um, because you're spinning the spindle, Fair enough. probably drawing a little bit more power. But um, I, I think the, the main concern here, let's look at, the, let's look at a, a, a formula that can describe what goes into the cost per cut, right? So the cost, And so what, what did we say that it equals? So there was the cost of cutting time. So the, the cost of when we're actually engaging the tool with the material, making the shape the customer wanted. There's the, the non-cutting time. So there's a cost for when in between the tool changes. So the, if the program uses several tools, when the tool's moving to the tool changer and is rotating the tool changer around the new tools coming down, it's not actually cutting, but it does take time, right? So there's non-cutting time. There's the cost of changing the tools. And that's when we're physically putting new tools in the machine tool. And there's the cost of the tool itself. Did we leave anything out? The cost for cutting was the, the cost of the cutting time, the cost of the non-cutting time, the cost of the tool changes, and the cost of the tool. What did we leave out? Labor, the material. Power. Yeah. Well, so, so they can build it all these times, right? Or anything that has a time about time associated with it, the labor is built into. Donuts and coffee for the manufacturer. Sorry, Donuts. wanted to keep that joke alive. Uh, well, that's going to go as overhead. So we, we left out the cost of the material. Excuse me. And so the cost of the material does not have a time factor. The cost of the tool does not have a direct time factor. The cost of the tool chain does. So that's a function of time. This is a function of time. This is a function of time. And so what we can find out if we want to find out what's the correct speed What's the correct speed versus the cost to make the parts? So we've got speed here and cost here. And we wanna know what's the right speed. We can plot the cost of cutting. And as we go faster, the cost of cutting appears to go down. And we can plot the cost of the tool change. And as we go faster, the cost of the tool change appears to go up. 
And if we add those two graphs together, we'll get a minimum value that shows us an optimal speed for cutting these parts under these conditions. So who does this? You could also solve the equations mathematically. But who, who does this? When, when do you do this? So I've, I've seen I've seen an MQP do this. They were analyzing a factory. They went there to try to help the people running the factory understand how they could save money in their factory. And they did these kind of calculations. But you can't do it if you're making 100 parts. You do it when you're making the parts as fast as you can make them and the customers want to buy them faster. You don't do this when you have a short production run. You do this when you have a large production run and you have to make the parts faster because the customers want to buy them faster than you can make them. That's when you're going to do this kind of analysis. But you can always think about it. And you can always know that the faster I run the part, the more heat that gets generated, the, uh, the faster the tools are going to wear out and it's going to cost more. <coughs> I had a... Um, I had a part that we were running right after I bought my uh, my company, and we we're grinding a really hard material, and it really depended on what the delivery date the customer requested was on how much it cost us to make those parts because we couldn't not deliver on time for the customer. We had to always be on time for the customer, and sometimes they would ask us on Thursday to have a bunch of parts for them on Monday, and we'd have to work through the weekend to make those parts. But I could have the cycle time for one part vary from eight minutes to 25 minutes. And if I made them one part every 25 minutes, I couldn't detect the tool wear. And if I made one part every eight minutes, I took a thousandths of an inch of material off the tool for each part. But I could make them one part every eight minutes. So if I had to make the, uh, <clears throat> if I had to make the customer's delivery time, I had to run that fast. And so that was, that was pretty amazing. We had to adjust the tool offset every part about a thou because the tool wore out that much. Good thing that the tool was like this big around. So it took a while to get down. So so small we had to change the tool. Um, but that was that was the kind of that was the kind of part where you you need to increase the speed. You know it's going to increase the cost, but even if we lost money on those parts, we had to keep the customer happy. <clears throat> so that was, um, all right, that was that. So what do we got? We're at 8.50, it's time to end the class. I did say I wanted to, uh, to quickly go over the, um, the homework assignment. And uh, also tomorrow at 11, I'm doing my, um, my weekly meeting with the lab participants who are working remotely from home. You guys are welcome to join that. Tomorrow, we're going to actually do an experiment, and I'll send out the details to the class for, for how you can do this experiment at home. You can do it in the library, too, I suppose. Just clean up after your, yourself when you're done with that. Uh, but to do this experiment, um, you need a stick of butter and a butter knife. And, um, and we're going to do that experiment tomorrow at 11. Everybody's welcome to join us. Um, so very quickly, if anybody wants to stick around, I will take a look at the, um, I've got too many tabs open. I'm just gonna find it. Take a look at the assignment um, for next Friday. Being how much does it cost assignment? Say again. Are you referring to the how much does it cost yeah. assignment? Yeah, yeah, I'm just gonna pull up the instructions so we can go through and make sure everybody understands. But I know if you've got to run to another class, go do that. Um, and this will be right at the end of the video.
for today's class. How much is that going to cost? All right. It's published. I need to share the screen. All right. So I should be sharing the screen that I meant to share. You guys can see that. Estimated the cost of starting a manufacturing company from scratch. And we're going we're gonna to talk in detail about this on Thursday. So don't feel like you need to get all of the questions answered right away. <clears throat> but I want you to imagine that you're starting a machining, a manufacturing company from scratch. And the, the company is being created to make your new product, your new product, we're, we're making the prototypes in the lab right now. It's the ME 1800 Sterling engine. That's your product. You believe that people are gonna buy those, those uh, engines from you. And so you've, you've got this vision to start this company. You're gonna need to determine your startup costs. And, um, and we're gonna talk about what assumptions you should make in, uh, in the lecture on Thursday <clears throat> for how you're gonna do this. I want you to, to think four years out into the future and, and think of how the company is gonna be operating four years from now. And, uh, and at what price point that you're gonna sell your Sterling engines. Uh, and, uh, and of course, what the volume of sales that you need in order to be profitable at that price point. The, the company is gonna start, oh, I normally do this as a group project. You can assume that you have two partners. So if you live in a uh, if you live in a Worcester three decker, it's probably a three bedroom house. So it's you and your roommates have decided to make this company, and so just assume that you have two partners here, where it talks about group members. Um, the first year of operating your company, you're not going to take a salary. All of you have to have another job that first year, or you need to to live at mom's house and and beg food from mom. Um, you should, after one year, you may begin taking a salary from the company. Um, and you've got, if you've got investors, you need to make sure that you've paid them off by the end of the third year. So if you borrow money or, uh, or you bring in investors, make sure that you've paid your investors by the end of the third year. Um, and if you add any employees besides the group members, You'll have to pay them starting the day you hire them. You can't wait a year to pay your employees. This is all in the, uh, in the instructions. And so the assignment is to submit a business plan no longer than four pages that includes your startup costs and your operating projections and budget. And this is what we're gonna go through in class on Thursday is how to make one of these budgets. <clears throat> your budget should include the cost to make the first part price points of sales projections and cash flow profit rate projections annually. And attached, we've given you a bill of materials for the parts for the Sterling engine. Let's make sure the link works. Redirecting, yes, please do that. All right. Maybe just copy the link and paste it into a search form. I, I think I just need to right click and open a new tab. Oh, it downloaded the file. Got it. I was thinking it was going to open up to the uh, to the web, but it downloaded an Excel file. And yeah, so we've told you how much the steel wool costs, and we've given you part numbers for the other items, so you can find out how much they cost. Or we've given you the size for the aluminum. And again, on Thursday, we're going to go through how to get, how to find those numbers. Why are most of the entries empty on that bill of materials? What do you mean? Pull the bill of materials again. I'll probably have to download it again. If you could go to like the files and select the downloads folder. It should be the best, most recent thing. <clears throat> You'll know how unit cost is empty, cost is empty. Yeah, yeah, you need to fill in those numbers. Oh, okay. We've sorry, given I'm sorry. Parts. You need to fill in those numbers and, and determine that. Um, and on Thursday, we're gonna talk about how to, get, how to get access to that information. All right, I think that's it. Does anybody have any more questions?
I guess this might be tackled on Thursday, but um, what's the big format for a business plan? Are we looking at part essay, part presentation? Are we looking at? Um, yeah, well, I'll, we'll talk about it on Thursday. All right, thank you.